Hello everyone and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IS. Today in this session we are going to have a discussion on the 2nd of April 2024, the Hindu newspaper. So let's begin with the list of articles first. We have these four articles that we are going to discuss in detail and all these articles come from various different parts of your syllabus. So we'll discuss about the PMLA, we'll discuss about AI in elections, we'll discuss about the solar situation or the solar energy situation in India and then the problem that we are looking at when it comes to the protests in Ladakh. So we'll try to understand what the issues are and then the problem again the controversies that we have seen with the Kachavtivu island and then one thing is about a language that is Bhojpuri language the issues that have been discussed here and then one small article on ozone found on Jupiter's moon and then lastly one article that is based on a new, what has happened as a new development that there is an air strike that has been done by Israel in Iranian consulate in Syria. So let's begin with the first article and that is the PMLA, a law that has lost its way. Now why exactly are we talking about this law when it comes to this PMLA, PMLA stands for Prevention of Money Laundering Act of 2022. Now this when it comes to this particular act this is something that was enacted back in 2022 sorry 2002 as a response to the global concerns with there were glo uh, growing global concerns over the laundering of the proceeds especially from drug traffic trafficking and some of the other serious offenses. And this is something this threatened the stability of economies all across the world and the sovereignty of the nations as well. And that's why this concern is something that was raised in the United Nations also where we see that there was establishment of the Financial Action Task Force. Financial Action Task Force back in 1988. And this was largely to look into all the money related issues in drug trafficking. So recently there was another article in the Hindu also about the FATF and how uh, FATF has asked for the countries to also implement certain laws with regard to the virtual assets and how it should also come as a part of the FATF. So if you want I have also discussed about FATF in the daily quiz session that I have taken for the 31st of March. So you can go there and you can see uh, that particular article there as well. So now when it comes to this this is where we see that the concerns were raised in this FATF and FATF formation happened and this is where we see that there were further reinforcements by the United Nations General Assembly where they passed a resolution in 1990 so that they could urge the nations to enact legislations to counter money laundering altogether. So that's why initially that what we see is that the PMLA it focused primarily only on combating the laundering of drug money. And this is something that was in line with the international efforts and all the resolutions that we had. But however, what we have seen is that over a period of time, there are various amendments that have happened. And the significance of this act and you can say even uh, the scope of its this act has broadened significantly. And it has started incorporating a wide array of offenses that go beyond only drug related focus. So that's why we see that now it has gone beyond drug trafficking. Initially it was only related to largely drug trafficking but now we see that we have gone beyond that. And then in this case what we see is that this kind of expansion it has led to a lot of criticisms to the act as well. And overall when it comes to let's say while the criminal may not have had the same economic impact or the threat level as the drug money laundering still we see that there are uh, a lot of instances where a lot of other crimes also have been uh, taken as a part of the PMLA. Now one of the controversial aspects of PMLA has been the approach uh, that where we see that it uh, to the presumption of innocence. Traditionally what happens is that in most of the cases we see that accusation is presumed or uh, the accused basically is presumed to be innocent unless proven guilty. But when it comes to PMLA, PMLA has a very different approach here just the opposite approach where what it say, say, says is that uh, particularly through a lot of stringent bail provisions etc where, which require a, a judge to be satisfied of the accused's innocence before granting bail. 
meaning that this is just the opposite that traditional practices basically where we see that the accused is presumed to be innocent but in this case we see that uh, assumes the guilt particularly affecting the accused right to bail that you will be presumed to be guilty unless you are proven to be innocent which is just the opposite of what happens in the other cases so that's why this has led to concerns about the violation of fundamental rights as well because although the supreme court of india has upheld these provisions citing that they are aligned with the act's objectives yet there are issues that have been raised so for example when it comes to the bail provision specifically it has been garnered attention for its political significance and the challenges that it poses to personal liberty of a person and that's why a supreme court judgment that happened back in 2018 it had declared that it is unconstitutional but then uh, subsequently it was also restored and then it was amended by the parliament as well and later on we see that there was a judgment in 2022 by the supreme court which has up, which had upheld the revised provisions that were brought about by the parliament so that's why we see that initially in 2018 initially in 2018 we see that the supreme court had struck down all right so supreme court had struck down struck down the bail provision all right supreme court had struck down the bail provision and then after that we see that there were amendments that were done so after that we see that there were amendments that were done and once the amendments were done we see that in 2022 supreme court now had actually upheld the revised provision so supreme court this time upheld the revised provisions so this is what we see in this particular scenario altogether that overall supreme court uh, largely said that this is now in line with the requirements of the act and hence this is what it is so that's why in summary you can say that pmla represents india's commitment to the international efforts against money laundering particularly related to drug trafficking but overall we see that there are certain provisions there are uh, the evolu uh, the evolution that we have seen has raised certain questions about its breadth and also the impact that it has on personal freedom and also the balance that we see between combating crime and upholding the fundamental legal principles altogether so that's why there are all these things that we need to understand uh, as a part of the provisions now overall when it comes to this uh, prevention of money money laundering act understand what exactly this prevention of money laundering act says because there are a lot of uh, areas that we need to understand so first basically it is to prevent and control money laundering activities right so that was the main agenda to prevent and control money laundering so this is the basic agenda when it comes to uh, the provisions of this particular act now overall what we see is that it also uh, gives uh, as a part of this act it can also seize and confiscate the properties that have been derived from money laundering and that's why we see that there is a legal setup there is a legal setup or framework to enable the investigation of money laundering cases and to also impose the penalties on everyone who is involved in this particular scenario so there are a lot of key important provisions that we see all together that how exactly does it define money laundering so for example it defines money laundering as involving directly or indirectly in any process or activity uh, how exactly the activities are connected with the proceeds of crime so in in any case in any one of the ways where it is acquiring or using or uh, 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 let's say uh, creating new properties which is based on money laundering so overall there are rigorous punishments that have been given as a part of this and it belong uh, it goes from 3 years to almost up to 7 years along with a lot of fines the term can be extended up to 10 years of time for money laundering in specific cases which is related to narcotic drugs and uh, the psychotropic substances so that's why just remember that when it comes to the punishment when it comes to 
the punishment it can be ranging from 3 to 7 years and it can extend to 10 years in case of specially in case of narcotic drugs all right in case of narcotic drugs and then psychotropic substances as well psychotropic substances as well so for that it can go up to 10 years and it also authorizes the provisional attachment of property also which is believed to be proceeds of crime for a period not extending up to uh, 6 months or 180 days so there are all these things that we see with regard to money laundering and overall we see that when it comes to money laundering it, this is a case where we see that the role of ED or enforcement directorate also comes into the picture because they also have been involved in uh, looking into the cases of money laundering and they are the ones they also go and they would be looking towards all these issues that are being caused because of money laundering so that's why they become very very crucial in all these cases so overall when it comes to the PMLA we have seen that there are several uh, amendments that have happened to strengthen its provisions and also to ensure that we can align it with all the international standards that have been set by the FATF so that's why when it comes to the amendments we have seen that they have expanded the definition of money laundering uh, they have increased the penalties they have also widened the scope of the law to also improve or include a very broad range of crimes which goes beyond drug trafficking only and overall that's why we see that they all have been able to enhance the power of the enforcement agencies and have been able to introduce very stringent uh, provisions here altogether so that's why there are all these uh, ways in which PMLA has been strengthened and this is where we see that uh, there have been certain criticisms also as has been mentioned uh, in the article that one aspect of you are uh, said to be guilty unless you are proven to be innocent so that is very uh, problematic part in a lot of cases because there are potential misuse of the impact that can happen on the civil liberties because it can be used uh, with political motive as well so that's why there are all these cases or issues that have been raised against the aspects of PMLA from time to time so there were, that's why there are all these uh, things that we need to understand from the perspective of the PMLA alright now so that's why just remember about PMLA and how exactly PMLA all together because we have been talking about ED and the role of ED all this while and in the context of ED also this PMLA becomes very crucial then coming to the second article and this is about artificial intelligence in elections the good the bad and the ugly now overall when it comes to the PML uh, sorry uh, to the use of AI in elections we know that there are various ways in which AI can be used some can be obviously good some can be very bad so that's why we need to understand both the aspects of the important good side of uh, AI usage in elections as well as the dark side of usage of AI in elections so how exactly do we see it and this is where this article starts from where it says that that in an effort to broaden Prime Minister Narendra Modi's reach to a variety of linguistic groups the BJP has used AI to translate the speeches into eight different languages ahead of the Lok Sabha elections now this is where we see that this uh, so that's why uh, in, in a manner uh, it has been by the author it has been listed as potentially India's first AI election. So now we know that AI is going to play a part and recently we have also seen that the election commission also had raised certain concerns with regard to the use of AI and how AI especially the use of generative AI can also be very dangerous because it can be used in various different ways which always not be good so that's why we need to understand the various aspects of how exactly AI is being used so that's why it also had called upon industry experts with regard to uh, the use of AI and how AI is being used so overall we know that when it comes to when you look at uh, the global scenario we know that globally it has been used to create misinformation and that's why there are a lot of different things for example whether it is about fake 
robo calls or the deep fakes uh, on which our prime minister had also raised certain concerns where some deep fake videos had surfaced a few months back and overall when it comes to this it can be used to manipulate elections we have seen cases in different parts of the world whether it is the us or slovakia or argentina in all these cases already we have seen that there have been cases where specifically there have been uh, blatant use of deep fakes uh, to create a lot of mis misinformation so that's why this uh, is something that needs to be understood well and overall when it comes to the provisions of the use of ai this is where we need to understand that ai offers a potential for improving the campaign strategies and it can do a lot of things, especially with regards to analytics. To understand analytics, to do micro-targeting, to understand the entire uh, voter base and to act according to the requirements of the voter base. So we see that there are these analytics being used by the political parties, that they are trying to understand what their voter base is looking for, what can work with them, what won't work with them. and all these things are being analyzed, a lot of surveys, etc. being also conducted by a lot of these uh, parties, etc. So that's why we need to understand that it can, uh, for the political parties, of course, it can also play a, a huge impact and they can mold their entire campaign according to what is being suggested by all these analytics. So that's why these analytics, many a times, they become very crucial in their functioning. and. Uh, and that's why we see that they will be using all this approach to ensure that they do better in the elections. Now, overall, when it comes to uh, this, we see that in response to the AI's misuse in the elections, we have seen that there are a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, steps that are being taken so that we can combat AI-generated content and to flagging of the AI generated content, to understanding of the AI generated content and how to ensure that real content can be seen uh, uh, differently uh, as compared to the fake content or the AI generated content. All these things are also being uh, taken care of. So that's why we see that there are a lot of these problems, there are a lot of these issues that are being raised because of AI. So we need to understand both the sides, that there are goods that may be AI also suggests that okay, if you bring in this scheme or if you promise these schemes yeah, uh, as a part of your election campaign, maybe it is going to work in your, uh, in, in your favor and all these things will help you in uh, winning the election. So maybe the uh, political parties start thinking in that sense that okay, if we bring in actually, if we actually bring in a social change or if we actually want to bring in social justice, these are the things that we should be doing. So that's why maybe these are the things that will help altogether in uh, making some kind of maybe positive change also in people's life and not only be used as analytics as a tool to win elections at all costs. So I know that every political party will want to win elections at all costs but maybe AI brings that side that when AI starts suggesting that these are the positive steps that you need to take if you want to uh, win the elections and hence maybe uh, we might see that the political parties might go in that direction but unfortunately the chances of that happening in any political campaign not only in India but across the world is very very difficult and unfortunately we have seen that in the last couple of years wherever elections have happened there has been blatant use of deep fakes and other AI generated content which has been used only and only for making sure that their political campaigns do well and it has not not been associated with anything else altogether. So that's why we still need to see what exactly is the role that AI plays uh, in the next two, three months and what are the things being done by the various political parties to bring in the aspect of AI in this particular campaign. Now coming to the next article that is again on your editorial page, sorry, uh, this is page number 6, page number 6 on the editorial page and this is related to GS paper 3 that is environment and ecology. Now in this sense what we are talking about is solar energy and the how solar energy or the solar industry in India needs to grow without compromising on quality. Now there are various aspects that have been brought in and there are things that are being uh, discussed here. So especially in this context, the models and manufacturers of solar photovoltaic modules 
रिक्वायरमेंट फॉर कंपलसरी रजिस्ट्रेशन ऑर्डर ऑफ 2019 सो दिस इज वेयर दिस इज द कॉन्टेक्स्ट इन विच दिस इंटायर आर्टिकल इज बीइंग टॉक्ड अबाउट सो लेट्स ट्राई टू अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट आर द थिंग्स हियर दैट वी आर सी नाउ फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल व्हेन इट कम्स टू सोलर एनर्जी व्हेन इट कम्स टू सोलर एनर्जी you might know that india has a very steep solar energy target or in general renewable energy target that we want that we should have a total installed capacity a total installed capacity for renewable energy of 500 gigawatt of 500 gigawatt by 2030 out of which it is expected that solar energy is going to play the biggest role so that's why what we see is that uh, when it comes to Uh, in this context we see that there are a, a lot of new government policies that will start coming in in the new uh, financial year and that's why in this context when we talk about the approved models uh, and manufacturers of solar photovoltaic modules order of 2019 it is something that mandates that solar module manufacturers they should undergo an inspection of their manufacturing facilities by national institute of solar energy to be listed as approved now they have to do that so anyone who is uh, making any let's say solar panel so solar panels which are required for getting solar energy for uh, generating solar energy or converting solar energy into electricity right so this is what the role of a solar panel is that solar panel which is made of certain semiconductors solar panels would convert solar energy into electricity right so it would convert solar energy into electricity now in this particular regard what they this rule is saying that any manufacturer has to go undergo inspection of their manufacturing facilities and that has to be approved by national institute of solar energy so it has been it has to be approved by national institute of solar energy now in this context this approval becomes very crucial because this approval uh, is something for the companies to participate in the government tenders uh, for the solar energy projects and including uh, all the recently announced uh, uh, solar rooftop energy schemes as well so that's why in this context when it comes to this policy this policy primarily is trying to target the reduced imports from china because right now china dominates with about 80% of the global solar module supply and especially given uh, the kind of diplomatic relations that have been going down between india and china india has to ensure that there is an aspect of domestic manufacturing as well so that we are not overly dependent on china in this entire context so that's why this is where we need to understand the various aspects of this so first thing that's why uh, we have to understand that uh, china accounts for nearly 80% of the global supply of solar parts so that's why in this particular scenario where we have strains in the relation uh, between india and china we need to understand that we have to have uh, global uh, we have to have uh, domestic manufacturers who are going to counter all these imports that otherwise we have to do so overall that's why because we have a target of almost 500 gigawatt of non fossil fuels by 2000 30 and then this context when it comes to solar energy specifically in this context when it comes to solar energy specifically solar energy has to contribute 280 gigawatt in total let me not write renewable energy but non fossil non fossil do you know that there is a difference between uh, there are these two terms interestingly that are used by governments all across the world one of course you know renewable energy and the second term is non fossil or non coal non petroleum non fossil do you think both these are the same or the different or are they different terms you tell tell us in the comments we'll reply you based on whether you have given the correct answer or not whether do you think that renewable energy and non fossil mean the same thing or are these two terms different so we have a target of non fossil fuel uh, installation capacity of 500 gigawatt by 2030 where 280 gigawatt has to come from solar energy so please tell me whether do you think these two are similar terms or are they different terms so 
when it comes to now uh, India, we have to understand that we have been aiming to add almost 40 gigawatt of solar capacity annually until 2030. Now the progress if you look at last 5 years, it has been very slow. It has been just around 13 gigawatt per annum. Now when it comes to 13 gigawatt in the last 5 years versus 40 gigawatt capacity annually by 2030, this looks like a very stringent task for us. And overall, uh, we know that because of COVID-19 pandemic, it played a big role in that. But starting now, if we want to accelerate the capacity add to addition of 25 to 40 gigawatt additionally, uh, annually, is going to be very, very difficult task for India. And that's why, however, when it comes to achieving these targets, it becomes very challenging also because of the domestic industry's inability to meet the demand for the panels and all the component cells which also is heavily reliant um, on the imports. So that's why this situation becomes very disadvantageous for the uh, domestic manufacturers who also uh, have certification cost and they lose out on the orders to the cheaper imported panels altogether. So there are all these challenges and to address these challenges and to support the domestic production, the government now has enforced this approval list policy from the 1st of April. So that's why we have to see uh, what happens to this policy and the success of this policy will also be measured by what happens in 2030. Whether we are able to achieve the targets, how close do we get to the targets. So all these things, uh, ensuring that solar power remains and affordable for most of the Indians at the same time. All these things will have to be taken care of by the government of India. So that's why uh, the success will be gauged based on that. That whether we have reached the target whether we get to the required target of 280, whether it is cheap and affordable for the people of the country uh, in all this. So we have to see whether we have we are going there and that's why this becomes very crucial as a part of this policy because this is because it emphasizes on the need for the domestic manufacturers to adhere to the stringent quality standards without compromising on the cost and the quality for uh, the reasons where we want to also increase the domestic manufacturing altogether. And th that's why the entire aim is for Indian solar industry to grow and so that it can become to uh, have a higher quality export and that's why maybe uh, then this is where we start uh, giving these solar panels to other countries as well. There is a big market out there, there's a huge market out there and we understand that not a lot of countries are big fans of China and they do not want to be overly reliant on China. So they would be looking for alternatives. They would be looking for other countries who can export potentially the solar panels to them. And this is where it becomes very crucial for India to grab these kind of opportunities. Although we have been talking about these opportunities and even if you go back to 2014 and 2015 where we had made significant changes in the national uh, 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 the national policy that we have on solar energy. We understand that from that perspective, the national solar mission basically that we have. So as a part of the national solar mission, we started promoting domestic manufacturing, where we also face certain issues with the US as well. But we have been focusing on domestic manufacturing. But the problem is that the domestic manufacturing has not been up to the mark. And there has been certain issues that also have been raised uh, in these kind of scenarios. We see that some of the bigger com companies who have been here in this particular uh, segment uh, who have been producing uh, solar panels for a very long time, these bigger companies, these bigger Indian companies, they have also raised issues saying that look, uh, the tenders cannot be won by us because we are following certain standards and ma uh, making sure that we follow those standards also means that we uh, our prices will be higher compared to many of the other companies which are also competing competing for that tender and they have a very very uh, uh, cheap uh, product so according to these bigger companies for example one of the companies being shakti pumps and this shakti pumps company uh, makes uh, solar pumps all right so now solar pumps we know that there is a pm kusum scheme in, in case of solar pumps also. Now because of this PM Kusum scheme, uh, there were tenders uh, being given by the government uh, for getting solar pumps. Now what was being alleged by 
this Shakti Pumps company, which is a very big company, has been here for more than 30 years now and also exports a lot of solar pumps to other com countries as well. It has a huge base in Africa as well. So that's why they said that our parts are very good, our products are very good and that's why our prices are higher as compared to many of the other competitors who are also filing for that tender. And this is where we are losing out on a lot of uh, these tenders because our prices will be higher because of the material that we are using. Now that these kind of safety standards come in and all the approvals have to be done, this is where we would be able to ensure that we are producing better quality of solar pumps as well. And that also means that this is where we'll start doing better. We'll start doing better, we'll start producing better quality of solar parts, etc. Whether solar panels, solar pumps, whatever it is. So that's why uh, these kind of companies may start getting be uh, uh, better results altogether because they already have a big presence in the market. And that also helps in boosting the exports out of the country. So let's see uh, where it goes. But this is, that's why, a welcome step that we need to understand from this perspective. Now coming to the next article, Ladakh's protest, a hunger for justice. Now in this regard, when we are talking about uh, the protests in Ladakh, we see that there is a hunger strike that has been there by Sonam Wangchuk. And this is the second time that he has been sitting on this hunger strike. And now we see that there is a large uh, support from the people of Ladakh also that are being garnered to this particular protest. Now, why this protest? What are the issues? Let's try to understand that. So, first, altogether, this issue is about the sixth schedule, right? This issue is about the sixth schedule. Now, why this sixth schedule is important and why I have displayed such a beautiful picture of Ladakh along with sixth schedule, understand this. The sixth schedule basically provides for the administration of certain tribal areas in the country. Um, where they would have autonomous entities all right so this is where we see that these tribal areas tribal areas will be set up as autonomous entities all right tribal areas as autonomous entities now these provisions of the sixth schedule they are provided under two articles of the Indian Constitution. One is Article 244. One is Article 244 Part 2. And the other one is Article 275 Part 1. Now, these two articles of the Indian Constitution, these provide the various aspects of uh, the sixth schedule where we are saying that tribal areas can act as autonomous entities and in this regard we see that there are certain areas that have been given that have been brought under the sixth schedule so we have parts of Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, Mizoram etc all these are counted as all these are the specific areas which are counted as a part of the sixth schedule and that's why they would have their own sets of uh, autonomous uh, acts and laws that will be pro accounted for there. Now in this regard when it comes to Ladakh, the narrative around Ladakh's demand for statehood and its struggle with climate change, urbanization and the resource management is something which becomes a very multifaceted and deeply intertwined with the region's recent administrative changes also that we have seen. And at the same time a lot of environmental challenges that we have observed in the case of Ladakh. So that's why when it comes to uh, this particular article, that's why this article highlights that Sonam Wangchuk's hunger strike was initiated on March 6th and this is where this is basically a, about a demand for statehood for Ladakh and its inclusion in the 6th schedule of the Indian constitution and today we see that there is a lot of local support from people all across uh, uh, this uh, region of Ladakh and that's why we see that there are people now who are also sitting on hunger strike Although hunger strike of Sonam Wangchuk for now has ended, but we see that there is a larger support that his movement has gathered now. Now overall when it comes to this, we have to understand the, the crux of the current socio-political movement that we see in Ladakh. This is something that centers around the demand for two things. One, statehood and second, the sixth schedule. 
right now in this regard when it comes to the understanding of this this movement actually has gained momentum that has followed the reconstitution of Ladakh as a union territory or uh, and that to union territory without a legislation back in 2019 and that is where we see that uh, uh, when article 370 was removed and Jammu and Kashmir reorganization act was brought in this is where we see that this happened so now what we see is that this is where this um, becomes a union territory and with Ladakh not having the legislative power and even the local rights to land and the jobs altogether so that's why we see that there uh, altogether this happened in on in August 2019 after the removal of article 370 now in this particular scenario this shift basically has stripped Ladakh of certain powers and rights particularly with regard to the jobs and reservations for the locals and significantly the power transfers that have happened to the central government appointed officials and even let's say the governor the, uh, the lieutenant governor of Ladakh and all the bureaucrats who are not native to the region and that's why also being argued that they are not the ones who understand the problems of the region because these are areas which are very different from a very many many different parts of the country so that's why all the uh, the basic rules and laws that you apply in uh, the other parts of the country perhaps cannot be applied here for a lot of reasons one because this is one area which is surrounded by two of the hostile nations for us one being china and one being pakistan second also being the problems with regard to the ecology of this particular area we'll also discuss about that part so overall that's why we see that uh, all the leadership of ladakh whether it is the lay apex board or a lay apex body or let's say even the kargil democratic alliance they have been arguing that the formation of this uh, union territory it has actually uh, created a lot of problem for the local uh, population and that's a particularly in managing the land resources and the job allocations it has become a big challenge for them and that's why we see that there are uh, they also have pointed to certain policies for example uh, the 2023 draft Ladakh industrial land uh, allotment policy this is something that uh, sidelines the local councils in the decision making processes and that's why uh, regarding the land use regarding uh, the use of uh, the problems that they are facing the grievances that they have they are not being considered because the local authorities are not even involved in in making these kind of provisions and that's why the efforts to negotiate these issues with the central government have been ongoing but so far all those have been unsuccessful overall this is something that has led to a heightened protest that has seen um, in case of the hunger strikes that we have seen uh, also uh, with regard to the other uh, the greater autonomy that they have asked for so there are all these things that we have to understand now most importantly when it comes to the understanding of the resource management and the international uh, and the environmental concerns that this place faces this is the major problem that we need to also address now when it comes to the influx of tourism and the expansion of the urban infrastructure altogether these these things have also placed a significant strain on all the natural resources that we have in Ladakh and especially when it comes to the water resources the researches that have happened in these kind of areas they have uh, they have been indicating that the demand for water in Leh which is the largest uh, largest town in Ladakh it far exceeds the sustainable levels and that's why it has basically also uh, has the problems have increased mainly also because of tourism where when we look at the number of people and the tourism influx that we have seen in Ladakh so for example 2007 data says that annually there were not more than 50,000 people who were visiting Ladakh back in 2007 but when you look at a recent data when you look at a data from 2022 you will find that 2022-2023 you will find that, that this number now goes significantly higher and this number goes beyond 3 lakhs this number now goes beyond 3 lakhs now these are not areas that are meant to sustain this kind of population 
you already might know that this is a cold uh, desert area and that's why there is a huge scarcity of water and in that scarcity there is a huge demand rise that happens in uh, for water and that too when you look at the tourism influx most of the tourism influx that happens is between may to july in between may to july almost 70 percent almost 70 percent of all the uh, tourism influx that happens it happens only in these three months because after that uh, uh, once the winters they start to set in the the temperatures are very low and it becomes very harsh for people coming from other parts of the country to go and live there so that's why we see that there is a huge drop that happens after that but we see that there is a huge influx of tourists and that too when we look at the water resource usage we see that more water is actually being used by the tourists than the people who are locals in that area and not only that if you look at the data you'll see that out of the locals also the people who are uh, poorer they have very problematic access to water so overall they are also uh, relying on underground water resources which are also contaminated a lot of times and that's why the region's environmental challenges they are further uh, compounded by the climate change as well so that also poses a significant threat through the increasing frequency and intensity of the natural disasters that we have seen the floods the flash floods the landslides all these things that have been happening more and more in this area also the melting of the glaciers is also a bigger challenge altogether so so you have to understand that there are a lot of challenges that we are looking at that we have seen that uh, it being a wonderful tourist destination and why i started with uh, this particular image that it looks beautiful but unfortunately a lot of us a lot of tourists who are coming from the other parts of the country uh, we have very little understanding and dare i say we don't care what happens uh, to these areas after we leave we've been there for maybe five to seven days we go we enjoy we destroy uh, we create a lot of waste we throw the wastes here and there and we come back happily to our homes and then we maintain cleanliness in our houses but unfortunately these areas are very fragile areas and they are not meant uh, to support these kind of uh, issues that tourists a lot of tourists are creating so that's why one problem that we see has been the influx of influx of tourism is it good for the economy many might say yes it has been wonderful for the economy of that area but the way the degradation is happening the economy of that area will not sustain for very long the way we are looking at the influx it will not last very long secondly the problem that we see with regard to climate change now because of climate change what do we see because of climate change we see that the extreme weather events the extreme weather events they have been on a rise we have seen the cases of flash floods where more than 200 people uh, almost lost their lives we have seen the cases of uh, landslides etc in in these areas and overall uh, the melting of the glaciers which are very specifically important they are very critical uh, water resources and they also act as natural barriers against a lot of these disasters but we see that uh, the melting of the glaciers is also accelerating and that mainly is happening because of two things one because of climate change so climate change of course leads to melting of glaciers it does lead to melting of glaciers but at the same time the setting up of industries in this areas setting up of industries in these areas this also becomes a challenge and this also has been leading to melting of glaciers how because when it comes to these industries when it comes to these industries you might know that these industrial uh, activities they would increase the pollution levels and including black carbon including black carbon and a couple of days back we had discussed about black carbon also last week i had discussed in one of the articles about black carbon and black carbon basically will set on the glaciers <coughs> and this is where it will uh, fasten the melting of the glaciers altogether and at the same time we see that there is an increased vehicular 
traffic also because of tourism and that also leads to uh, melting of glaciers so even tourism even tourism plays its place in the melt uh, its role in the melting of the glaciers so that's why we have to understand that ladakh's situation is a very complex interplay of administrative restructuring uh, 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 structuring that we have done the local governance and local governance not having any say in a lot of governance related issues the kind of environmental uh, problems that we have started seeing the climate change impact that we are looking at in this particular area so that's why we see that the region's demand for statehood and a greater autonomy under the sixth schedule are not only about political representation but it's also about securing the means to manage and also to protect the natural resources effectively in this particular area and in the face of uh, growing environmental and uh, climate change pressures we need to understand these issues better if you go i mean i would suggest that you do that uh, if you go to sonam vanchuk's uh, youtube channel you see that for the past 10 15 years he has been posting a lot of content with regard to climate change and how the things can go from bad to worse for a, a place like ladakh which has a lot of uh, issues with regard to especially the fragile ecosystem that it it is placed in and the kind of changes that it can bring in not only for ladakh remember this not only for ladakh but for the entire ecosystem that is being fed by these areas the rivers which are being fed by these areas the climate impact that they have on the weather of other nearby areas it can have a negative impact on all these things and it's not only about the local people of ladakh it's something that is going to have a major repercussion for the other parts of the country as well so that's why from this perspective we need to understand all these areas and all these problems that we are witnessing right now now coming to an article and a news that has been in the news for the past couple of days and this is regarding uh, the spar over kachatiwu island now in this case of kachatiwu island what we see is that for the last couple of year uh, last couple of days there have been controversies here and where we have seen that uh, first the from the side of bjp uh, it started where they said that Uh, the, it was Congress who had handed over the Kachatiwu Island to Sri Lanka, and then uh, co Congress also hitting back and saying that uh, there are discussions that were done, and it was all a part of the discussion. And at the same time, you have also done something similar, so you are not the ones to comment. Now, this what about we will keep on happening. So these kind of things will, I mean, for the next two months, we do not know uh, to what extent somebody is going to go down. which party is going to go down and how far they are willing to go we do not know and that's why every day there will be controversies from the biggest of uh, the decisions that one government might have taken whether the present government or the previous governments might have taken to the smallest of the things that you can think of whether somebody can make a gold roti or not will also be discussed in these kind of elections so uh, so unfortunately all these things will happen for the next couple of months but we are not bothered about the controversies the controversies are not going to be uh, asked but let's try to understand the kachatiwu island and what exactly is this island and what does it represent altogether now this is a very small uninhabited uh, inhabited island which is located in the park strait right this is located in the park strait now in this particular scenario now when it comes to this uh, uh, particular scenario now this is where this lies as you can see just between india and sri lanka now the island is very small it covers almost around 2.6 square kilometers only and the geographical in uh, position that it has it makes it a point of contention between india and sri lanka and which was which was there for many years and largely because of the proximity that it has to both the countries and also it being very rich fishing ground um, and the rich fishing ground that you have surrounding all these areas now when you go back to the history the island was originally a part of the jurisdiction of uh, raja of ramnath which was a part of india before the british colonial so you have the raja of ramnath and that's why you can say that before 
a British colonial period, it would have been said to be a part of India. Now, after India's independence and establishment of Sri Lanka as a separate dominion, this is where the status of Kachatevu Island became a matter of dispute. And in 1974, there was a bilateral agreement that happened between India and Sri Lanka. And as a part of this bilateral agreement, we see that officially we ceded these islands to Sri Lanka. So, that's why this was 1974 as a part of the agreement that was signed. We officially, we ceded this island to Sri Lanka. Now, overall this agreement basically had aimed to resolve the maritime boundary issues that we were facing in this region. But since then it has been a source of ongoing dispute as well and particularly among the fishermen from both the countries. So that is where we have seen that these issues still persist. The main issue that is surrounding the Kachatiyu island has been basically involving the fishing rights and the maritime security. Indian fishermen, they have traditionally used the water around the Kachatiyu island for fishing. But following the session that we saw in 1974, there have been numerous in, uh, instances where we've seen that Sri Lankan Navy and the Indian fishermen, they have been on the both the sides and there have been a lot of arrests of the Indian fishermen and detentions have happened and occasional violence has also been seen around this island. And that's why these incidents have actually caused a lot of diplomatic strains between India and Sri Lanka as well. Despite various talks and despite various efforts uh, to resolve these kind of fishing disputes. So that's why this island itself does not have a permanent settlement. But it becomes very very crucial because of these kind of issues. There is a Roman Catholic shrine or a church that you have there. Where we see that there is an annual pilgrimage that also happens from both India and Sri Lanka. Now, but this pilgrimage is just one of those few times when the people uh, are found in this particular uh, island. Otherwise, we see that it becomes uh, 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 an area which is largely seen because of the issues regarding the fishermen. Now, also that's a, just also understand that when it comes to India uh, ceding this to Sri Lanka, why did we do that? There was a bilateral agreement that happened in 1974 and this was you can say a larger effort to try and solve the bilateral issues around these areas. So that's why first thing from the perspective of the clarification of the maritime boundary that before the secession uh, the maritime boundaries between India and Sri Lanka were not very clearly defined and that's why it led to a lot of disputes and incidences at the sea as well. And this agreement was aimed to establish a very clear democratic lines to prevent these kind of issues. So that's why this was, you can say in a manner, a clarification. Clarification of maritime boundaries. Alright? Clarification of the maritime boundaries between India and Sri Lanka. And then apart from that, uh, we see that there are other reasons why this was done. So for example, when it comes to uh, the diplomatic relations, we see that ceding these islands, they were also seen as a gesture of goodwill from India towards Sri Lanka to also try and strengthen the bilateral relations between India and Sri Lanka. And during that period, we saw that both the countries were interested in maintaining and enhancing the friendly ties. And that's why resolving this issue was a step in that direction back then. So that's why it also helps us in having better diplomatic relations. Better diplomatic relations. Then at the same time, we see that there were claims from both the sides and this is where we, in a manner, we tried to solve the issue. We formally tried to solve the issue back then. And then at the same time, uh, it was also about the fishing rights that although uh, the cessation agreement allowed the Indian fishermen to continue exercising the traditional fishing rights that they had in the water around these islands, it did not very, uh, you can say that it did not confer them to the rights to fish within the Sri Lankan territorial, territorial waters. And that's why we see that these provisions, they aim to balance the interest of both the countries. Although we have seen that it had led to a lot of disputes that hap has happened after that, and especially among the fishermen communities from these two uh, countries, 
but still we see that we try to solve that issue and overall we see that strategically it perhaps would have been a good decision taken by India a gesture of goodwill to build better relations with Sri Lanka so we tried all that uh, but we know that still there are certain issues that we are looking at from the perspective of these islands so just understand these kind of areas where we have to understand what exactly is uh, the context of the issues that we have seen in this area now coming to another article and this is about political reality everybody loves a bhojpuri star but the language remains marginal to mainstream politics now what exactly are we talking about now in this particular regard when it comes to the language bhojpuri uh, what we see is that overall when it comes to this language we have seen that uh, bhojpuri as you know that bhojpuri is an indo aryan language and it is spoken primarily in the north uh, eastern part of uh, india where it comes to parts of india and the eastern hindi subgroup that we have where you have languages like maithili bhojpuri avdhi etc so all these uh, magahi being another one so there are all these different languages that are spoken there now first thing when it comes to bhojpuri it is predominantly spoken in the states of bihar uttar pradesh and jharkhand and we see that there are significant population of uh, bhojpuri speakers in other parts as well even in delhi or west bengal also you will find the speakers of bhojpuri even in nepal you will find the speakers of bhojpuri and the diaspora of bhojpuri goes to other countries as well for example in mauritius in fiji in suriname in guyana in trinidad and tobacco in even in south africa in all these countries also you will find that uh, people are actually speaking bhojpuri so that's why it goes beyond uh, it goes beyond just india so that's why in indian states we know that there are three states of bihar uttar pradesh and jharkhand these are the primarily three states where it is largely spoken and then apart from that there are other parts of the world where it, it is also spoken uh, bordering bihar is nepal so nepal is one area where uh, nepal is one country where it is spoken then you also have mauritius so in mauritius also we see that it is uh, a language that is uh, spoken all right so at the same time uh, apart from mauritius we see that in fiji also it is spoken in suriname also it is spoken in suriname it is also spoken in guyana it's it is also spoken then you also have trinidad and tobacco where it, it is also spoken and even you will see that there is some presence even in south africa of bhojpuri now the language has been known for its rich cultural traditional traditions and it has a very vibrant folk music and dance as well and at the same time we see that it has been a part of media there is bhojpuri cinema industry also that has been functioning so there are all these we see that cultural aspects of it it has uh, when it comes to the linguistic features we see that it has several dialects and there are considerable degree of uh, inter uh, in, interchangeability also that we see in this particular language uh, and especially we see that there are a lot of common commonalities that we see with many of the other indo are in languages that are spoken in these kind of areas but it has a very unique characteristic now overall it has a very rich cultural history as well very rich uh, uh, literature history as well a lot of poetry a lot of folklore all this is there in in this case of bhojpuri now when it comes to bhojpuri there is one problem that we face here and despite all the widespread use of bhojpuri that we see that there are 5.6 crore speakers of bhojpuri in india despite that we see that it has not been included in the 8th schedule of the indian constitution 
and which is where you are giving the official status to any language and this has implications for its use in education in governance in literature so there are all these things now that's why there are certain efforts that are being made by the scholars and also some of the cultural activists to secure a official status for bhojpuri in the indian language to ensure its preservation and development as well but overall we see that there are certain issues that we are facing and uh, recognition of these issues they become very very crucial in this aspect so if i speak about the issues the very first issue is the lack of official recognition the lack of official recognition it also means that that it is not being taught in schools that it is not being used in official communications it is not being used in formal education anywhere so that's why this is something that leads to uh, affecting negatively the languages development and the prestige so that's why this is where we see that the lack of official recognition is a big factor then at the same time we see that there is a lack of educational resources lack of educational resources that we also see with particular uh, case of bhojpuri the absence of bhojpuri in the formal education system means lack of textbooks lack of learning material and you can say there are not more not a lot of qualified teachers to impart education in bhojpuri and that is something that impacts the literacy rate in the language as well and also in its standardization then also one of the major problems especially something that has grown in the last 30 40 odd years is the cultural stigma the cultural stigma that we have seen around bhojpuri that very often it has faced stigmatization due to the stereotypes that are associated with the speakers of the bhojpuri language and sometimes it has been perceived as less prestigious uh, than many of the other languages and that also affects the self esteem of the speakers of this particular language and that has also led to the decline of its usage among the younger generation as well now this is also one more aspect is very very important to understand the media representation while we know that uh, we have a very good amount of very good uh, bhojpuri cinema and music but at the same time the quality and the content of some of the bhojpuri media also has products which has been criticized for not adequately representing uh, this particular culture and the languages rich heritage and culture that uh, we observe here so that also has been a major problem the media representation media representation through some of the films and the music that many a times the classness of the bhojpuri music that comes out uh, is something that also brings in some kind of you can say negative name in bhojpuri otherwise when you if you actually know the bhojpuri folk songs and if, if you actually know the uh, folk bhojpuri music that's very different and that's very rich and it's wonderful but unfortunately Uh, the kind of uh, bhojpuri music that comes in the media has uh, a lot of crassness and that has led to stereotyping of bhojpuri language and bhojpuri speakers as well so that's something that we have to understand that we need to understand the problems here and we need to perpetuate the negative stereotypes and something that hinders the language acceptance uh, and the broad in the broader circles altogether so that is also something that we need to understand from the perspective of the language that something related to the stigma and also one of the issues that we see is that uh, that media representation has been bad that somebody would tell you that it itna neeman bhasha ba but when you come back, that is meaning that it's such a beautiful language but because you are not connected with that language you are seeing the other side of the language you unfortunately are not going to get the real side of it one of the issues also has been digital presence that presence of bhojpuri in the digital platforms and technology in this growing world is very limited and that also affects the language's adaptability to the modern uh, communication methods and that's why we see that this is also the where the access to accessibility of uh, language to the younger generation is a problem and this is also where we need to understand that 
when it comes to these areas where specifically Bhojpuri language is spoken, these are also areas from where people have moved out. Whether it is Bihar or Uttar Pradesh or Jharkhand, the native speakers of Bhojpuri, they have moved out in search of jobs, in search of opportunities. So that's why unfortunately they are not connected with the language and once you go on from generation 1 to generation 2 which has been living out only, they probably will have no clue about the, what the language is and that also is reducing the total penetration of this language altogether even within its native speakers. So that's why there are a lot of these issues that we need to understand and there is certain thing, there are certain areas that we need to understand from the perspective of the growth of this language and we need to move beyond just the Bhojpuri stars and uh, having the fan following of them but also the fan following of this language is something that we need. Let's move on to our next topic. This is uh, related to GS Paper 3 Science and Technology that an international team, they basically have discovered evidence of ozone on Callisto that is one of the moons of Jupiter. Now, so just remember that on Callisto, one of the moons of Jupiter, they have found traces of ozone, evidences of ozone. Now this is where when it comes to this particular scenario, there was uh, there was an article that was published, uh, a report that was published on uh, how exactly there are certain aspects of Callisto's surface where they have also found sulfur dioxide. Now the team also identified that there was uh, ultra there was uh, ultraviolet absorption that was happening on this ozone, uh, sorry, on this particular moon and that is only possible if ozone is present. So ozone is present. So that's why we know that when it comes to ozone, ozone is very crucial for protecting the earth from the harmful ultraviolet radiations and specifically two parts of ultraviolet radiations. Now when it comes to the ultraviolet radiations, just remember that there are three types of ultraviolet radiations, ultraviolet A, ultraviolet B and ultraviolet C. where Ultraviolet C is the shortest, the wavelength is the shortest, wavelength is the shortest but because of that it has the highest energy, it has the highest energy and that's why it can be very damaging, that's why it can be highly damaging but because of the ozone layer that we have in the atmosphere, ozone layer does not let the ultraviolet C to pass through it. It will completely absorb the ultraviolet C in this layer itself. And when it comes to ultraviolet B also, 95% of ultraviolet B will also be absorbed by the ozone layer. And only ultraviolet A is able to penetrate through. Now ultraviolet can be bad and that's why when you look at your sunscreens, the sunscreens which has uh, sun protection factor that is SPF, you'll see that the higher SPF that is SPF 50, 60 etc, they'll write that they protect you against ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B. They do not talk about C. Why? Because ultraviolet C is taken care of by the ozone layer itself. So that's why its presence on Callisto, it also uh, indicates possibility of uh, oxygen presence as well which becomes very crucial for you know supporting life altogether on a planet. So that's why this new discovery that has happened, this is something that becomes very crucial. Now in this context of Callisto, Callisto is Jupiter's second largest moon and that's why and it also has a composition of water ice and, uh, and a lot of rocky material, sulfur dioxide, organic compounds etc. So that's why it makes it a candidate for extraterrestrial life. So that's why just remember that when it comes to Callisto, Callisto is Jupiter's second largest moon, second largest moon, alright, then it has water ice, it has sulfur di dioxide as well and that's why uh, and there are organic compounds also. So there are organic compounds as well. So with all that we understand that it becomes a candidate for finding life. Now overall that's why we see that there are all these things, all these studies that have happened on Callisto and this is something that can uh, lead to finding new evidences and maybe something very uh, interesting in the form of the structure that we see in Callisto. Now this has been found by the physical research lab that is PRL, physical research lab. 
that you have in Ahmedabad. Now this is where we see that they have found the surface conditions using something called as uh, vacuum ultraviolet photons and that is something uh, vacuum ultraviolet photons and these vacuum vacuum ultraviolet photons these basically you, you should just know that these just try to replicate the solar radiation they just try to replicate what the solar, solar radiations are and how the solar radiations are so that's why they become very crucial uh, in this entire context of understanding of the presence of ozone in this area now coming to our last article and this is about Israeli airstrike destroys Iranian consulate in Syria now in all uh, when it comes to this article now this becomes a very important uh, development in the same ongoing problem that we see in the Israel Palestine issue now we already know that Israel has had its problem with Iran as well now in this context this is a big development that when you look at this area we know that uh, Syria is an area which is very near to uh, Israel now what we saw was that there was an Israeli airstrike that targeted the consular uh, section of Iran's embassy in Syria and this resulted in the destruction of the building and also a death that happened of a senior Iranian military advisor and there are some, uh, some uh, and some other people as well now this is something which becomes very crucial because now it might escalate the tensions between Israel and Iran and overall we understand that this is something that can become very dangerous because uh, despite the habitual lack of the official uh, uh, Israeli acknowledgement of such strikes we see that the reports they come uh, in this entire context and that's why when it comes to the death of uh, uh, something someone who is a very very important part of is Israel's uh, governance this can become a heightened tension and we do not know what it can what kind of uh, shape it can take in the future because Iran also says that now we are also going to do something similar that there will be a like like for like lip reply that Iran will do towards Israel so maybe this is a new escalation and one should only hope that the things do not escalate further now coming to the mains questions the first question that we have today is examine the implications of granting the sixth schedule status and statehood to Ladakh in the context of its unique geographical cultural and ecological characteristics so that's why we have to talk about all we talked about the geographical aspects we talked about the ecological aspects we need to understand the cultural aspects also so for example this is an area which has very very high tribal population so that is also one of the reasons of why there is a demand for uh, Ladakh's inclusion into the sixth schedule so that's why there are all these things and why for the preservation of its geography of its ecology and also for its culture and tradition it is very important that it gets uh, gets uh, uh, included as a part of the sixth schedule then the second question discuss the potential benefits and challenges of integrating ai in political campaigns and suggest measures to ensure ethical use of ai in elections so we know that there are various ways in which the use of AI can be done in these kind of campaigns but there are ethical problems and we need to understand where the ethical problems lie and how the election commission specifically and the central government they need to address these kind of issues. So this is it for today's session. I hope that this session has been helpful for you. Please do subscribe to our channel and like the videos and comment on all the initiatives that we have just to tell you and announce that there are initiatives other initiatives for example the daily quiz also that we are running every day at 6 pm in the evening where we discuss some of the questions related to the prelims examination from many of these articles that we have discussed and some of it that we have not discussed in these uh, daily hindu analysis so that is going to be very helpful for you in your prelims examination so with this i uh, take your permission to end this session Thank you very much for being here.